Hello and welcome to Millions of Screens. I'm creator producer Leo Garcia, joined via Zoom by TV Awards editor Libby Hill and DV deputy editor Ben Travers. And today we're talking awards. Nothing but awards. Who got up at 5 a.m.? Uh, I got up at 3.30. I, I was just going to bed at like three. I know. We, we were so awesome. close. We were so close. The world yeah. can't survive with both of you asleep at the same time. It is millions and millions of little screens. Can't you shut up? I'm busy. Boy, what a great show. Well, skipping ahead to the clicker. No clicker. We, got too, Whoa. we have too much awards conversation to get through. Today was a big day. Because not only did the Golden Globes make their announcements far too early in the morning, but the Writers Guild also made their nominations for their award show. Uh, well, what what do you guys what did you guys focus on in terms of the WGA noms? Uh, Libby, obviously, you wrote uh, an article saying like how there really isn't a ton of crossover between the HFPA and the WGA. Obviously, there isn't for, for good reason for various reasons. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> Yes. Which we'll, we'll get into some of those reasons later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was it was curious. It was um, uh, this is maybe unfortunate, and this is maybe not something everyone wants to hear. But uh, the more these awards come out, the nominations come out, the more I am reminded how this has not been the strongest year uh, of television, uh, for good reason. Like there, there's there's every reason for that. But there are days when I wake up and I was like, is there no good TV? And while obviously that's not true it feels much more true than it did maybe 18 months ago. So the Writers Guild nominations are good, um, as good as the set of nominations that includes the boys can be. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Shots whoa. fired. Shots whoa. across the bow. I have a laser baby all the shots me. to take. Yeah, laser baby is listening. Hell, we give them enough free advertising. I think they can take some shots. <laughs> I don't... I, it's hard to talk about them and it's hard to write about them because they were fine. They were certainly better. They were certainly different than the Golden Globe nominations. Um, some of the things that were that I that I really liked, uh, they really threw their love behind uh, both Ted Lasso and The Great. The Great is it is it, not everyone can not everyone can um, not everyone is a fan of The Great, but it certainly has its um, yes yes I know it was you. Uh, but it certainly has its backers. The interesting thing about Lasso and The Great is that they got nominated in new series and also comedy series. And also each show got a nomination in episode. Um, so they got a nom nomination for an episode as well. They are not actually the, the top rewarded shows, however, because, well, The Simpsons exists. And also... Um, <laughs> And, and and also, finally, Better Call Saul did really well. Um, they have done pretty well at the WGAs historically. They had seen a slight downturn in recent seasons, but they got three episodes nominated and also uh, were nominated for drama series. So for that alone, it's, uh, it's a nice thing. The WGAs come at a really nice time because they can play catch up for things that might have been overlooked last season. Um, and also look ahead a little bit of what may be in play at the Emmys down the road. Libby, before I let Ben respond with his thoughts on the WGA and to, to either fire shots back about the boys and or the oh, great. Jesus. One thing I like, I totally agree that like looking at these lists, you might be thinking there's not as much competition, it seems, for these categories. It's sort of what I think. It's like because there were less shows, obviously the pandemic affected everything there's sort of less cream that can rise. But like when you look at that comedy, those comedy series nominations, like it doesn't see, doesn't seem like a ton is potentially lacking. You can definitely swap some things in and out, but like, that's a solid five some. No, certainly not. But I think I look at last year's, uh, last year's crop of WGA nominees in this category. Last, last year it was Barry, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Pen15, Russian Doll, and V. WJ will always have a lot. I will always have a lot of love for them because they are like the only place that consistently remembers Pen15, and and is celebrating that. Uh, last year, Pen15 got both um, comedy series and new series uh, nominations, and it might have gotten in an episode. But WJ is very curious because their episode nominations don't often overlap as much with their series nominations as you would expect. 
Um, so things get a little weird there, but um, yeah, Pen15 Forever. For fans who might be upset, Schitt's Creek was not nominated for any WGA awards, likely because the levies belong to the Writers Guild of Canada, which makes sense if you think about it. I think the same probably goes, wait, what? I think the same probably goes for Michaela Cole and I May Destroy You. Um, that was a British co-production, I believe. And um, she is British. We ran into the same thing with Fleabag last season. So um, yeah, this is all, there wasn't any glaring mistakes, not that that would have shown up in comedy series, but yeah. Ben, what are you more surprised? What are you more surprised by? Uh, the boy showing up in best drama series or Raised by Wolves getting an episodic drama nod? <laughs> Absolutely Raised by Wolves getting the episodic drama nod. As I told in, uh, as I told Karen Jones in our post awards email exchange this morning, uh, I was not surprised at all by the flight attendant success, but I was quite surprised by Raised by Wolves being included, which, uh, you know, more power to the weirdness. So, uh, good on them. What I will say is, is uh, first to the idea that the five best shows, the five of the five made the cut. Uh, let me just remind everyone that Better Things was eligible this year. So while we're both wearing the Pamela Adlon glasses, let's remember Pamela Adlon. I was, not, um, I was uncertain if it was or not, because I get confused about these things. I'm a dumb dumb. Yeah. Well, no, it's, uh, let's, let's remember it's still 2020. We have no idea what time meant. Uh, and even in other years, it's very difficult to keep track of when TV actually premiered. So, um, what I'd say about the WJ awards is, is very much what Libby was hinting at kindly in the sense of, um, there's a great disparity between the series nominees and the episodic nominees. And on the, on the kind of positive end, it's nice to spread the love and, um, it's nice to, uh, see as many shows uh, across television be highlighted as are deserving. Um, but it also can create some significant whiplash when you're just reading the nominations, especially when you start at the top and you see what we do in the shadows included in comedy series and you remember, oh man, remember when that got three episodic comedy writing nods at the Emmys last year? No one, this thing's gonna slay. And then nothing for the rest of these, this list and it just kind of baffles you when all of a sudden Aquafina's Comedy Central series which was a fine show that did well enough for what it was at the start um, is, is included when suddenly Dead to Me pops up when uh, Grace and Frankie a show that I love makes a resurgence uh, when High Maintenance uh, a show that just ended gets a, a last ditch nod for its final season like some of those things are great and some of them are just like what is happening I don't understand how they could how they could kind of switch from one thing to the next and uh as libby also alluded to it's it's similarly jarring to look at kind of the original long form and the adapted long form nominees because you're like okay yeah sure mrs america i i can see that that making the cut but where where's what is safety i don't remember ever hearing of something called safety and uncle frank was uh widely panned on amazon i i don't quite understand how that ended up making the I cut i never even heard and, of it but, uh, you know, it's great to see Bad Education nominated. It's great to see a movie, you know, up against uh, other limited series in the adapted log form. And Good Lord Bird is deserving. Queen's Gambit is deserving. But then Clouds is just sitting there. And you're like, Clouds is really the, the, the fifth best choice for long form. And again, Clouds is not bad. It's fine. It's, it's just one of those things where kind of the degree of excellence, I guess, is jarring to me in terms of... of where the priorities were placed and and the kind of lack of a pattern that you can pull out from from the nominated list like it's it's just i'm so used to scanning these things and being like oh okay that's a favorite oh they really like this one and, and it just seems like okay, i guess fifty thousand people all voted for fifty thousand different things like they just all picked one and they got their one onto the list and sometimes that overlap but not really i don't know it was just it was just a, a very strange morning for that to come right after the Globes, when usually I can rely on the WGAs to be a, a, a strong corrective to a lot of what else has happened in the uh, Winter Awards season. Oh, sorry. They were just a mild corrective today. Right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, because I it. just listened to everything <laughs> you said about the WGAs, and uh, everything in my brain was just like, and yet, not the Golden Globes. Um, well, before we move on to the Golden Globes, which I think we have a lot to talk about, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Quibi 
the now dead Quibi, <laughs> was nominated for two WGA awards. I do like that in your head you think of it as I would I would be remiss not to mention this. <laughs> like it's we'd we'd all be remiss if we didn't mention that Quibi was nominated for two WGA awards for the 2020 television season. All right, so here it's time time to talk about the Globes. Uh, I did not wake up at 5 a.m., but some people did. And I did, when I did eventually wake up, look at the nominees and some of the buzz. And my general thought was, why do we still care about the HSPA and what they think is good or bad? Um, among, among the several things that occurred this morning, uh, we mentioned it earlier, HBO's I May Destroy You was snubbed completely in, in every potential category. Yet shows like Ratchet <laughs> earned three nominations i think i have that right uh a show that i think some people enjoyed but i mostly saw as a punchline and i want i wanted to say this just so i can say the title emily in paris because that's the way you're supposed to say it what was nominated why do we care about the hfpa i mean that's not even to get into like the mistakes they made in the film side of things as well why why do we care about the hfpa why are we giving them any more power they obviously have these insane biases that are on display, especially the past couple of years. Uh, and I, I think they obviously have no self-awareness of how the rest of the world views uh, film narrative. Why do we care? Who wants to answer that question? It seems like there, it seems like it's an awful list of nominees. It's not great. It's, it's not a great co- uh, a crop of nominees. It uh, did. It was one of the things that made me think oh tv is bad now um but also i i I don't have a good answer for why we care about the golden globes other than we just have cared about the golden globes for a long time it's the theoretical kickoff to the film award season um and uh i don't so i blame film I, i blame film um they really have very little relevance in the in the in the TV world. Um, they can, they want to be tastemakers, and and they can sometimes get in ahead of the ahead of the curve. They were the first ones on the marvelous Mrs. Maisel bandwagon, and I really do think that kind of stirring endorsement um, carried through into the Emmys. Um, because Amy Sherman Palladino wasn't some like beloved figure w- within the awards communities. Um, she'd been a she'd been there forever, but it's not like Gilmore Girls was an <laughs> awards powerhouse. Um, but more often than not, they're just uh, rounding up their gaggle of movie stars to populate their red carpet. And um, if they aren't getting enough on the film side. Uh, for competitive films, then they'll come over to TV. I mean, they always come over to TV and and find out who's slumming it uh, in limited series and will nominate them. And it just doesn't seem like an like anywhere near an accurate representation. But then they'll 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 kick other people to the curb. Like it's this wild vacillation between we want to go with these really buzzy people who no one's ever heard of and then, Nicole Kidman and the cast of Big Little Lies, like, but no in between, because like, Little Fires Everywhere got no Golden Globe nominations, and that's Globes bait if I've ever seen it. Mrs. America got one for Blanchette and didn't even make it in limited series. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think what bothers me the most is there's no internal coherence. Ben sort of mentioned that with the WGA, and I think it's also true with the Golden Globes. Like. You know, you they know you know they're gonna love the crown. This year, it seems they they finally got on board with Ozark, but beyond that, it's it's sort of a shit show. I think what you're talking about too is one of the things that was so discombobulating, and perhaps one of the reasons why the backlash has seemed stronger than usual this year. Like there's there's always an inexplicable group of nominees when it comes to the Golden Globes, and usually people who've paid enough attention to them for long enough can kind of understand how they ended up where they ended up or or not be too surprised that they picked the show that everybody else has kind of written off um but this year they didn't really balance that out with the kind of advocacy for unknowns that we're used to seeing on their behalf like 
you can go back to, I mean, you can go back much further than what I'm going to say, but like in my mind, I usually remember that they really loved Brooklyn Nine-Nine right out of the gate, and they were strong supporters of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. They were big supporters of Rachel Bloom for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, that really helped the show kind of, you know, persevere over the years. And they've had a, a number of those kind of things. Like even last year, they gave the, the um, they gave the gold to Rami, uh, which was a nice little boom for, for, the, for the Hulu series. Um, and he got nominated again this year. But so many of the shows that are dominating the list in this year's Golden Globe nominations are older shows. It's almost like they've given up. The Crown, yes, leads with six. They love The Crown. They always will. No surprise there. No need for any kind of attention other than just kind of acknowledging you are doing a good job. Good for you. Schitt's Creek uh, got the second most nominations with five, and that's a show that the HFP has ignored completely until now. Like, they never were on board with Schitt's Creek, and then they got popular, and it was like, oh, okay, I think we'll finally let you into the club. Um, but that's almost like them giving up. It's not It's not them supporting something that needs it. Uh, Ozark is the same way. That's That got four nominations. Uh, the Undoing is kind of the, the limited series embodiment of the same kind of attitude, where like if somehow the Golden Globes had come out at the start of the series and given it a big boost, then that could have fed into the collective fervor that surrounded people who stuck with it week to week and were like, what's going to happen? I don't know what it's going to But as soon as it ended... Everybody was like, okay, this show biffed it. They, 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 the landing was rough. It wasn't worth the time. It, it just didn't go anywhere. And they're still rewarding it with four nominations. So uh, you could make an argument that something like The Great uh, with three nominations and Ratchet with three nominations are those picks this year for the Golden Globes. Uh, but The Great tried and failed at Emmys, uh, and that just kind of leaves it with a, a weird aftertaste uh, whereas ratchet was something that uh, as i put in the snubs piece uh was released about two months before one of the most heated elections uh in our country's history uh and it became the one thing that we could all agree on uh is that ratchet was bad and now the hfpa is trying to destroy that one common bond that we have by trying to tell us that ratchet is good but i don't, and how dare I don't know if that's what it's trying to do because to to that point and we talked about this pre-pod when Ryan Murphy's The Prom dropped on Netflix, everyone everyone knew that it was simultaneously bad and would get Golden Globes nominations. And maybe there's a similar energy to Ratchet. I apologize, I have not watched. But the idea being that like it's it, it can't be good when you can predict what bad things are going to be uh, celebrated by an awards body. Well, I don't, I don't think that's a good thing, but I would say that, it, again, continuing with the idea, um, the Golden Globes version of, of kind of telling everybody to stick it uh, with when it came to the prom was by nominating James Corden, <laughs> because even the people who are like, oh, yeah, sure, Meryl Streep will get in, and maybe the prom will get a musical comedy nod, but they're not going to nominate James Corden, the one who everybody hated like everybody the other i was like this is a problem you've done something horrible here uh and they still decided no 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 we're smarter than you um and yeah i i i i think the other thing with when it comes to ranching is just the idea that as we saw this year and, and lydia wrote about beautifully in, in the analysis piece netflix continues to do extremely well uh at the golden globes there they they really spiked last year and they, they beat their own record in terms of total nominations uh, this year. Um, they had 42 nominations, 22 in film and 20 in TV. Right. And this is... 34 last year. Yeah. And this is the thing. It's like... We've almost come to expect more from them than even that. To have three of the five television dramas be netflix dramas just seems like too much two of the five sure but this is the globes like the globes really like star shows and they like showtime things and they like these kind of weird you know like we're gonna pick something out of the wilderness and really highlight it so for them to go for the third uh <laughs> and the third being ratchet is still again somewhat surprising to me like again we, we have it on the list of careful of what you wish for nominees but there, there, there might be a universe where ozark's the one that gets booted out there if you're only asking for two netflix shows well technically when i made my predictions i didn't have ozark or ratchet because i thought they kind of just lean into the crown and they never really liked ozark other than jason bateman so i wasn't sure if it could break through perry mason um, baby so I thought I thought Perry had a shot, but no, no, sorry. Um, so anyway, that that's kind of what I think is stimulating 
that same thought process that you mentioned, Leo, and, and you expanded on Libby of, of why do we care about the Globes this year? That question has become more prominent because they're not even doing the, the bare minimum thing that they are usually reliable enough to, to put up, which is celebrate some wild card picks that are, that are pretty cool. I will say uh, it is actively offensive to me to nominate Sarah Paulson for a Golden Globe for Ratchet when you could have nominated her for a Golden Globe for Mrs. America. Like, what are we doing here? Or at the very least nominated her for two. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say to that. Is there, is there not, not that we want to dive too deep into uh, what is going on in the minds of the HFPA, but along the lines of that, uh, I may destroy you snub, the fact that of the 40 television acting nominations, only three are people of color. Uh, that's not a great ratio. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know if there's if there will if there will be some sort of reckoning, but it definitely seems like someone has to be. Sh- shaken awake to say like you re- you realize this is what's happening right the, the thing about the hfpa is they're never shaken shaken awake like that's just not that they're not on this they're not of this planet they are not uh on our wavelength they are just doing their own thing and their own thing is very white very extremely white um but yeah, they, they had plenty of opportunities to... I know that they've never embraced Insecure uh, for some reason, um, which is which is a great comedy uh, from Issa Rae. Um, there, was, uh, there was Lovecraft Country, which was nominated for series, if that's... Yep. It, it, but none of, the, none of the actors got in, which seems ridiculous to me not to mention bridgerton allegedly netflix's biggest show ever um very steamy very sexy very outlandery which was a show that um the golden globes has previously embraced and nothing absolutely nothing they could have been the first ones out of the gate to to get on the bridgerton train and they just let it leave the station they have never really embraced Shonda Rhimes shows. Shonda Rhimes, of course, produced Bridgerton. I I mean, we're talking about people who only nominated Kerry Washington once for Scandal. Like, that's bananas um, for it being the Golden Globes. That should have been a multiple globe winning role. Like, that that is tailor-made for the Globes. Um, And Kerry Washington didn't get in for Little Fires Everywhere either. Like, they... There was plenty of opportunities. There were plenty of contenders and yet nothing. And it's not the first time. Uh, Ben, we were talking before the podcast, like the huge snubs from last year, um, which were actively embarrassing. Do you want to, do you want to talk about those a little? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's always, whenever I do the snubs and surprises pieces year to year, I always try to phrase like try to put context around the phrase snub, which is to say that, you know, it's not like they're purposefully excluding something because they don't like it or they, they, it's, they, they want to embarrass it or they, you know, they, they were hoping, you know, to cause an uproar or whatever it is. Uh, though with everything you're talking about, it's starting to make me question whether or not the more natural uh, understanding of the word snub does apply to the HFPA when it comes to shows from black creators and with black casts and with people of color in general because it just doesn't it just does seem fairly aggressive and that's that to me was made blindingly clear last year when Watchmen, a show that was both critically hailed and rightfully crowned at the Emmys uh, a few months later um, and, and also just you know filled with people who <laughs> who everybody likes and wants to see at award shows uh, it was it was completely snubbed and well and then watched. The Duverdes, and it was uh, yeah no and well watched great ratings uh, very popular at the time and it, it, again it was their chance to be the kingmaker quote unquote that they like to be um, when they see us didn't offer them that opportunity but it was still 
a very well watched, very well received, very well respected limited series that was also shut out in uh, 2020. Um, so for Bridgerton and I May Destroy You, and uh, even you know, like you mentioned, the Lovecraft Country actors to be denied, and for the show to get in just seems absolutely baffling to me because the acting was the strongest part by far of that show. Um, and Journey Smollett. I anyway, know. I can't. I just can't. Um, it it is it is really the thing that makes you want to take a step back and say, we're not going to give this thing air. We're not going to talk about this thing. We're not going to care about this thing because we're only supporting the big crazy machine and letting them keep the power that they have so that they don't have to listen to us. Uh, but to me, the, 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 the crux of the matter is we have to talk about it because we have to hold their feet to the fire, even if they're pretending like they don't feel it. But the only way they're really going to feel it is if the ratings cave if they lose ratings then it's going to matter if people don't watch the golden globes then it's going to matter and they're going to have to make changes just like so many other award shows who've seen ratings tank have scrambled to try to come up with new ways to to you know, draw an audience in today's day and age however might we go about tanking the golden globes ratings so they are less relevant than ever ben do you have a master plan uh, yeah, I have two, I have two plans. Um, okay. You have two first, plans? I thought you only had one plan. Well, it's, I guess it's the same plan to, to tank the ratings okay. of the Golden Globes slash make them utterly irrelevant. But the first step in the plan is for IMDb to change their preferences on actor pages, actor crew, everybody. So that uh, if you are nominated or have won an Emmy, that is the priority over if you are nominated or have won a Golden Globe. But so far, the rankings are, when you see the little awards tile underneath a a person's name, whoever it is, Brian Cranston, uh, any of other really big winners, let's just stay with Brian Cranston. If you go to his page, it's going to say how many Golden Globes he's won. It's not going to say how many Emmys he's won. But he was nominated for an Oscar. So actually, the only thing you're going to see is that he has one Oscar nomination. But then, if that hadn't happened, before that happened, it was Globes and then Emmys. IMDb has to get its shit together and recognize the importance of the Emmys over the Golden Globes so that we can fix that first and foremost. Uh, but to go along with that, to kind of... You're absolutely as a, as a right, man. Agreement. Man, you nailed the Brian I, Cranston page. I recently visited it because I predicted him to get nominated and was uh, one of the few things I got correct. Anyway, um, to, to barter a nice little agreement between IMDb and the Emmys uh, is, is a little... Uh, way to move these things along. The Emmys need to get rid of their outdated timing. They need to change their calendar from the arcane broadcast TV schedule of of June through May, June of one year through May of the next year, and get onto the calendar year along with all the other award shows. That way, if they were able to have their ceremony in January or February, uh, one, their ratings would improve, as Libby has written about already, uh, because they wouldn't be in direct competition with the end of the baseball season, the start of the football season, as well as all of the natural TV releases that, in theory, they're supposed to be promoting, but really that doesn't work. It's just competition. They're, they're just not going to watch you. Um, and they're going to need to premiere in the dead zone of January and February when it comes to live sports, and TV needs live events to bolster that schedule. Uh, and then, two, if we can all come together like we already have in reality and recognize that the Emmys are the primary driver and the most prestigious award you can give to a, a TV show or actor or creator, uh, then it'll create a nice one-two combination of the Emmys are there for TV, the Oscars are there for film, and there's no room for anybody else. All the other award shows can be precursors, they can do their own thing, but the Golden Globes would just continue to be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth fiddle, all the way down the list until they are irrelevant. And that should be the goal until they change their ways. And the guilds would would sprinkle in between the the Emmys and the Oscars? Yeah, as they do They'd keep doing their thing. I like this idea. And Libby came up with the idea of having it Pro Bowl weekend, when there's no Pro Bowl weekend, when there's no football to contend with in between the AFC and NFC championship games and the Super Bowl that Sunday, let the Pro Bowl be in the in the middle of the day in Honolulu, and then yeah. boom, let's uh, let's let's see the Emmys. I mean, we're talking about we're we're talking about um, 
when people are still in the rhythm of watching the NFL every Sunday, um, they want to turn a live event on. And uh, yeah, why not give them the Emmys? Like it's it's a much better... Uh, the Pro Bowl, uh, as it is, would still be a much better lead-in than um, whatever the lead-in is in September. Um, and, and that's the thing. And, and I did write about this before. Say what you will about the pandemic. This is a very unique opportunity to mix things up. They were able to sort of embrace that with the ceremony itself, but they need to change the calendar. I mean, it, it's we, it's archaic. It doesn't make any sense. It confuses people. And as Ben mentioned pre-pod, like the the one thing that is keeping the HFPA relevant is right now the the Globes just has a higher uh, viewing base by what was the factor, Ben? By a factor of four? Three. 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 Yep. They're they got that sweet eighteen million number last year where uh, the Emmys uh, sank down to about six. But again, like. It, I think the way that the industry, although well aware of what the Golden Globes are, responds to those kind of things is by looking at those numbers. And I, I think if you look past the bare number, like the bare idea that the Golden Globes got 18 million and the Emmys only got six, and then you just say, okay, well then the Golden Globes are more popular than the Emmys, so then they matter more. It's it's that's not true. The, the what the consequence, the significance of the awards comes down to who's giving them how they're being given out, what's motivating them. You know, these, the Emmys are, you know, everyone's peers. It's creatives. It's everybody coming together under the TV Academy and celebrating television as television. Like, they understand it. They're making it. The HFPA is is 90-odd people who are used to giving out awards for film, don't really understand TV, and just kind of pick favorites at random. Uh, actually, that random would be probably better than how they pick their favorites. Um, so... Those numbers are a consequence of when the shows are airing. I, 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 I absolutely believe that if the Emmys position themselves uh, next to the Oscars, then they would absorb a lot of that prestige. It would be a very easy thing for audiences to process in terms of the Oscars are to film what the Emmys are to TV, as opposed to now it's like, well... Golden Globes do film and they're fun and that's nice, but I guess they're TV because they come out at the end of the year and they're right before the Oscars and that's the connection that I should understand. And the Emmys there are sometime. I don't know when. I can never remember. They just show up. The summer? I don't understand. The fall? <laughs> right. They're... Uh, it's baffling. So I, I I understand that the that the ratings are important and that's how we need to start shifting things, but they should also serve as motivation for the Emmys to make the change because... Uh, this is not a new argument to them. This is not a new idea. They've heard this. They've considered this. Uh, they have to reconsider it and they have to take it more seriously because uh, otherwise it's they're never going to crawl out of that hole. And not to beat a dead horse, but Libby's absolutely right. She was right when she wrote it last year and she's right now that like, if, it, if not last year, this year is the time, like there's still time to change it so that you can make it so the ceremony is in 2022 and it encapsulates everything that was made from the last deadline to the end of 2021. Pandemic has sort of slowed down productions. You'll have less of a pool of, of nominees to pick from. So it won't be like it's a bloated show because you're not picking from a full year and a half of, of, of shows. It just feels like everyone is so afraid of change. And I understand that. But now's the time to make those changes. I don't know if this is part of it, but I don't know if the Emmys want to be part of a season. I, I feel like the Emmys want to stand alone, but seasons are fun. That's why we have the holiday season, uh, because it's nice to think about something else for a while. Part of the reason the Golden Globes has such big ratings is it's because it's something to do. Like, it honors both film and TV. It's the kickoff to the film awards season. If you are into film, like, this is the beginning of your high holy days. TV could grow from that kind of exposure and that kind of like unity otherwise it's just it's devaluing the guild awards it's devaluing a lot of things that 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 are so easily overlooked for television specifically because they're not a part of its larger season i can try and launch the idea of a winter tv award season as much as i can but that's not a real thing you know, it, it just makes so much more sense to get their shit together, come in to come in 
join the crew, make it an actual TV award season, and automatically take your place as Queen Bee of it. Like, it, it, no one would question it. It would only raise your profile. Like, you, they would become the legitimate uh, TV equivalent to an Oscar. Um, to play devil's which is advocate. That they've never quite been able to do. To play devil's advocate, maybe there aren't enough billboards in LA. <laughs> To have, well, to, have, to have the Emmys take place in February or January. That way you can... Um, what do you do with the billboards price? in the summer? What do you do with the billboards in the summer? Well, you just, you like have PSAs, I guess. I'd love to pull an audience of people watching the Golden Globes and say, do you know how many people voted on these awards? Like, do you know who's voting on these awards? Because I bet you most of the people watching at home are just like, it's the industry, right? And not like 90 journalists across uh, across the Euro- Europe and, and the world. Well, b- before we move on from, to paraphrase a George Bush quote, uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations that the Golden Globes deal in, in terms of their uh, nomination process. Libby, do you have any final thoughts on Globes? Oh, no, I, 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 am, I am done with the Globes for today. Um... I shall fight another day with them. And by that, I mean tomorrow, Um, I'm sure. But it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, Something's got to give. Can we go wakeboarding with Ann Dowd? Oh, yes, absolutely we can. Great job. Great memory. Ben, uh, this past week, this past week has been Sundance. I've sort of been inundated with Sundance uh, video duties, but uh, <laughs> I was wondering if two things. It was Ann Dowd's birthday on Saturday, January thirtieth. That was also the day that the the movie she's in, Mass, premiered uh, at Sundance. Mass is, I think, it still doesn't have distribution. I think it's still seeking distribution, uh, and that's most likely related to the fact that uh, it is about two families coming together, uh, one of whom uh, their son was a school shooter, the other of whom uh, was a, had a child who was a victim of that shooter, and it's uh, years later and they're trying to get together to hash uh, a few things out. Um, it's one of those movies that absolutely kind of defies everything that you'd hear about it. Um, it shouldn't work. It should be just far too painful to be any kind of piece of entertainment whatsoever. Um, it's also from oh God, it's, it's Fran it's from, Kranz, a first, yeah, first time actor or first time director, former actor, current actor, whatever. Fran Kranz. Fran um, Kranz, my God. From and Dollhouse and, and and yeah, Cabin in the Woods. It's a movie that's told in real time as well. So, like, you you just sit with them in this room as they hash it out. No cuts, no, like, nothing kind of, you know, flashbacks or flash forwards or going out of the room or anything. So it feels like it should be this insufferable slog. And I will say that I was, like going, <laughs> I was going into it being like, this is going to be tough, but and out, it's your birthday. I have to watch this. Um, and I was surprised by how nimble it was and how accessible it was at the beginning for for so much of it they very slowly ease you in um kind of the the introduction also has a lot of kind of uh before you really know what's going on it has some kind of light physical and character comedy that works very well uh to kind of set things up and um by the time you're you realize what's going on and, and start digging into the emotional terrain you're so invested in these actors and in kind of the tension that's going on uh, that it, it just kind of waits to hit you at a very certain point. Like the, the heaviness of it doesn't really land until the end of the movie, which is how it should, and it's very much designed to do that. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an excellent film. Uh, it was a great way to spend Andal's birthday. I really hope it gets picked up so mo- more people can watch it. And I do encourage people that if, if you know all you do is kind of read or hear what the premise is, to trust in the actors and the people who are making it and... and not me, but other critics who've recommended it um, because it's it's very, very good. And Ant Out is uh, remarkable. Absolutely go wakeboarding with Ant Out if you get the chance. 
Mainly the screen is a production of the Penske Media Corporation and the theme music features excerpts of the classic YouTube video of Bjork talking about TV and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Our editor-in-chief is Dana Harris-Brightson. Our publisher is James Israel. And our executive editor is Ann Donahue. Our favorite 2021 WGA nominated scripts include Pen15, Ted Lasso, and What We Do in the Shadows. IndieWire's Millions of Screens endorses The Boys! Laser Baby! You can find us on Twitter at Million Screens, at Midwest Bitfire, at Ben T. Travers, and at Leo Garcia. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, so leave a review and let us know what you think. This is Ben, Libby, and Leo remind you, as always, that you shouldn't let poets lie to you. You shouldn't let poets lie to you. Ain't nothing wrong with a couple of cold brews and a cool podcast. <laughs>